Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to um, our NOAA round four. This is our third session. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce to you Dr. McDad Asaria. Um, I, McDad has become a health economist through a circuitous route. He started as computer science guy for financial institutions in London. He's worked with Department of Health in the UK. Um, and then he became a research assistant at the University of York, where I worked in, and met Mick Dad and became very good friends with him. Um, he, I don't know why he went there. It must have been a huge pay cut to go from London finance to um, university research assistant, but he um, did his PhD there and he has worked all over with the University of York. He worked in India for at least a year with the government there. And now he is an assistant professorial research fellow at the London School of Economics. And his research is um, around inequities in health and health financing and trying to make the world a better place. Um, and so we're, I'm really pleased to hear this talk from Mick Dad. Many of you know him from our NOAA, or our um, Alberta Health Economic Study Group a couple of years ago. He has done a lot of work in distributional cost effectiveness analysis. And, and so this area of equity is, um, he's, he's the expert to talk to about it. And so um, with that, I'll turn the time over to Mick Dad. Thank you. Thank you so much, Arden, and, and thank you all for having me. Um, so my topic for today is on COVID, race and racism. And so, um, and I'm going to talk about the UK. And in the UK, we've had a particular patterning of the impacts of COVID and particularly deaths from COVID in uh, particular ethnic minority groups. And, and so I want to talk a little bit about uh, what we've seen there and, and what may have been causing it and, and how the debate has played out in the UK. And, and then hopefully uh, in the questions we can pick up if there are any parallels with Canada. And, and um, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, this piece of work that I've been doing uh, funded by the Health Foundation in conjunction with a colleague there called Toby Watt. Uh, and so I'll outline um, some of what we've been doing. So this is very early stages in that research project. So also any uh, suggestions on where we take it would be very welcome. So, so first of all, I'm going to explain a little bit about ethnicity in the UK because not all of you will be familiar with the UK uh, in detail. Then I'll explain something about what we've seen in terms of COVID in the in the UK, uh, and then I'll go through some of our research ideas and, and looking at COVID through a kind of a decision analytical modeling approach, and then exploring the causes of these differential outputs in COVID using more of a social determinants of health approach, and then looking at some of the explanations that have been proposed for, for uh, the difference uh, in, in the observed deaths that we've been seeing in different groups. So, so let's begin. So, so what, what does ethnicity in the UK mean? So, um, so I think it's very difficult to talk about ethnicity in the UK without thinking about the British Empire. So the British uh, had colonized uh, a large chunk of the world. You can see here in pink the, all the different countries that they colonized. And they held on to these colonies for quite some time with the, the last major colony, uh, Hong Kong, gaining independence in 1997. And so a lot of the people, the non-white population in Britain are people who are from uh, various of these colonies, right? And so uh, if we look at the, the numbers of non-white people in the country, uh, there's almost 15% of the population uh, in the last census, which is now 10 years old, uh, were non-white. And if we're looking at particular countries that these have, have come from, the big contributors are uh, India, Pakistan, uh, the Caribbean, and Bangladesh, with others coming from, from these kind of uh, group together areas like Africa or other Asian groups or mixed groups. So, so these are kind of key countries where uh, populations have come to England from. Uh, and we, if we look at key uh, incidents or key waves of migration, so uh, there was a big migration after World War II. So a lot of the soldiers who fought uh, for the British in the World Wars were from British colonies. And 
uh, these soldiers after the wars, uh, a number of them settled down in the UK. Uh, another thing that happened after the war was uh, there was a lot of uh, destruction in England and there was a rebuild of the country and the economy. And as part of that rebuild, there was a, the creation of the NHS. And so uh, a lot of people were invited from various uh, colonies or ex-colonies or the Commonwealth as it became uh, to help rebuild the country and to work in the NHS as doctors and nurses. So that happened across all colonies. And then there were specific uh, incidents from different places. So in the Caribbean, there's what's known as a Windrush generation. And, and these are the people who came on uh, boats uh, that started around 1948. It's called Windrush because that was the name of the first boat that came carrying people. And then it's important just to think about who these people were. So these were people who uh, largely were taken as slaves by the British from West Africa to the Caribbean to work on sugar plantations. And then as slavery was abolished and they gained independence, uh, they started to come back to the mother country or England to, to work in uh, the NHS and to help rebuild the country. And so that started around 1948. Uh, then there was this, the big migration from Pakistan in the 1960s. So uh, when the British uh, left the Indian subcontinent, they partitioned it into uh, India and Pakistan at the time, East Pakistan and West Pakistan. And basically they partitioned it along religious lines where the two parts of Pakistan were the Muslim parts and, and India was the, the non-Muslim part. And there were kind of water issues and one of the, the water issues was uh, resolved by uh, this Indus Waters Treaty. And, and as part of that, a British company built a big dam in Kashmir called the Mangla Dam. And that caused a huge displacement of people and part of their compensation, some of these people were given uh, work permits to go to the UK. And so a large part of the uh, Pakistani population in the UK comes from that uh, one incident and, and the kind of chain of, of uh, migration that followed that incident. Uh, similarly, in, in Bangladesh, after the part partition of India into East and West Pakistan, these were two uh, countries essentially that were forced to be one, which were on different sides of India. Uh, and they spoke different languages and they had different cultures. And eventually uh, the Bangladeshis or the, the East Pakistanis as they were had a war of liberation. And at the end of the war following that, there was again another wave of uh, post-war migration. And then there was an interesting kind of Indian population who were uh, based in East Africa. And as the East African countries started to get independence, so they were taken by the British to East Africa to build railways and, and infrastructure in, in the African colonies of the British. And as those colonies started to get independence, uh, there was this kind of African nationalism movement that uh, wanted to expel foreigners. And then so as part of that, there was a big expulsion from uh, Kenya in the, the late 60s. And then Uganda had a the famous expulsion from India. I mean, so you can see all of these key migrant groups and these key migration incidents uh, are very linked to this, this idea of empire and colonialism and independence from colonialism. And uh, to give you uh, a bit of a taste of this from a kind of a legal perspective, at the, the kind of the after the war, the British put in this uh, citizenship act called the British Nationality Act. And so that created a citizen of the United Kingdom and the colonies. So 1947 was when uh, India gained independence from the British Empire. And so you can see that at that point, uh, they created the citizenship for people who were part of the colonies of the Commonwealth. And there was kind of more or less free movement of labor uh, of pe people uh, into England from its colonies or ex-colonies. Uh, and then uh, after a while, uh, the British people or the white British people got quite concerned and they started to put various restrictions on that immigration. And so in 1962, they put uh, they, in, they introduced a Commonwealth Immigrants Act that tightened up those borders. In 1968, to uh, keep Indians out from East Africa, they tightened those borders again. Uh, in 1971, where there's even more uh, attention on this, they, they wanted to keep allowing certain types of immigrants uh, namely white immigrants that they were more comfortable with and they were less comfortable with non-white immigrants. And so they allowed immigrants from the old Commonwealth, so Australia, New Zealand, white, white South Africans and Canadians to come in much more easily than those from other ex-colonies. 
and more recently to bring this up to date, uh, there have been these, these new immigration act, which have been uh, named by the government as a hostile environment uh, legislation. So, and these have basically made uh, people, made it very hard for people to come into the country at all. And, and as people do come in, they don't have any access to healthcare. They don't have any access to uh, any kind of unemployment benefits or, or public funds. And they're basically made to feel like they shouldn't be there and uh, they really shouldn't be migrating in. And so, so there's there's been this kind of continuity of um, yeah. So so let let me let me give you some some more real examples. So I'll, I'll give you a bit of a flavour uh, from various incidents that have happened in the news to give you a sense of of what. Uh, the response to immigration has been and how immigrants might uh, be perceived or, or perceive themselves in the UK. And so as people came in uh, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, these signs saying no Irish, no blacks, no dogs were quite common. And, and you'd see them on uh, housing, on restaurants, on various air, uh, places that were uh, banned for, for people from certain backgrounds to, to use. Uh, in 1968, there was this famous politician called Enoch Powell who gave a speech talking about how um, the country was being swamped by immigrants and soon it will be become a black country if we're not careful. And, and this is famous, famously known as the rivers of blood speech. Uh, more recently, we've had this character called Nigel Farage who's been talking about the importance of uh, the UK leaving the European Union. And you can see behind him, a river of, of uh, brown immigrants coming in. And so this has really framed the whole Brexit debate and, and encouraged people to say that we need to protect our borders and being part of Europe is allowing these immigrants to come in. Um, and as part of the hostile environment, the government has been driving these vans around telling people to go home and particularly uh, they've been driving them around in areas of high ethnic minority population saying, uh, you're not welcome here essentially. The Prime Minister himself has been uh, uh, attacking Muslim women in his newspaper articles and, and we've seen that after those articles there's been massive rises in Islamophobic incidents. Uh, we've also had 10 years of austerity so following the financial crisis there's been 10 years of cuts to public services uh, and these have really hollowed out uh, things like the NHS and, and various social services and the UN recently uh, in 2019 produced a report saying austerity measures and the hostile environment have been entrenching racism in the UK because the impacts of austerity have been very uh, racially patterned. Uh, there was this Grenfell Tower tragedy which really, uh, Grenfell Tower was a social housing project uh, in the centre of London which is predominantly inhabited by um, ethnic minority populations and uh, and the tower tragically burnt down and there were a whole bunch of uh, failings of government and social policy that that have been uh, linked to this burning down of Grenfell Tower and it really highlighted uh, racial problems in housing in the UK. There's been this Windrush scandal which many of you may have heard of where a lot of the people who came during those Windrush years from the Caribbean have now been classed as uh, illegal citizens under the Hostile Environment Act. And they've been denied access to healthcare, they've been uh, deported back to the Caribbean, there's been all sorts of uh, these incidents. And ever since the, um, the terrorist uh, attacks uh, on September 11th in the, the US, uh, the government has launched this counter-terrorism strategy which essentially uh, encourages or institutes racial profiling in, in public institutions. And so, so all of these things uh, are just there to show that actually um, that racial hierarchy that was there that underpinned empire uh, very much continues to today in various aspects of, of government policies and uh, non-white people in the UK are treated differently and there's a different attitude and environment towards them and this impacts the housing, this impacts their working conditions, this impacts their lives in various ways. So, so that's just some, a bit of background about who immigrants are and, and how they fit into the UK generally. Let me go to some of the, the data around COVID specifically now. So um, these are data from the 3rd of November, so a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the UK has had 47,000 deaths which are 
purely attributed to COVID-19 or 60,000 deaths of people with COVID-19 anywhere on their death certificate or actually probably the most reliable estimate is 67,000 deaths which are access to death that we've seen in previous years. So not all COVID deaths are recorded as COVID deaths. And so, so this gives us a sense of how big. And actually, when you actually population adjust these numbers, you find that the UK has had a very bad experience of COVID as compared to a lot of the other countries in the world. It's one of the worst countries out there. And as in other countries, men at any given age are approximately double as likely to die as women. Uh, old people are much, much more likely to die than younger people. And we found uh, people from Black, Pakistani and Bangladeshi groups are approximately four times more likely to die uh, than white people. Uh, and as we said, COVID-19 has come after 10 years of austerity during which the NHS and social welfare system have been heavily cut back. And this Brexit campaign that has really stroked um, xenophobia and racism in the country. And so let's look at these ethnic numbers a, a little bit more carefully. So black women were 4.3 times as likely to die as white women. Black men 4.2 times as likely to die as white men. Uh, Bangladeshi and Pakistani women 3.4 times as likely. Bangladeshi and Pakistani women 3.6 times as likely. So you can see these are huge multiples uh, of likelihoods. And, and these are all age adjusted figures. And it's important to think about the age adjustment because if you look at the, the age patterning uh, of COVID, in the in the UK, and I think this pretty much holds all around the world. Um, it really starts to hit at you know 60 years of age, and and post 80 years of age is where you get huge numbers of COVID deaths. So the the graph here shows deaths per million of population, and and if we look at the population in the UK uh, and look at in the red, I've highlighted the the you know the highest risk to age groups. You can see that uh, the white population is much older. And so you can see there's three times as many uh, people in the white population in the 60 to 80 age group as there are in Asian and black populations. And when you get to the 80 plus age group, there's five times as many. And so if you just looked at the raw numbers, you might think uh, there's nothing much going on. But when you start doing the age adjustment, then you see suddenly that you're seeing a lot more deaths in these non-white populations uh, adjusting for the fact that they're much younger. So it's, it's important to keep in mind that age is an uh, a good factor to think about. So let's start thinking about what could be going on. And, and so as part of this, uh, let's think about how does COVID work? And, and so if we think about COVID as a disease, you start off with a well or susceptible population and some proportion of that population gets infected with COVID. And some proportion of that population who gets infected is hospitalized. And then some of those people who are hospitalized die of COVID. And, and actually, there's a bunch of people who are infected with COVID that die without even going to hospital. And those might be people in care homes or people who've just not managed to access care. Whereas there's other groups of people who get infected and either are hospitalized or not, and they end up uh, recovering. And either they have asymptomatic COVID or they have what's called long COVID where they've got this kind of long-term but sub-hospitalization or subclinical symptoms or people who have who've had COVID and recovered. And you can think of these as kind of the, the immune group and then uh, some proportion of these might become susceptible again, depending on how long immunity lasts. So that's a kind of general picture of what's gone on with COVID uh, anywhere. And if we think about these differences in mortality rates, um, we can think about them in terms of just this top part of the diagram. Uh, and any differences between different groups in the population are because of some differences in, in these kind of proportions of, of probabilities A, B, C, and D. Right? So if we think about the number of COVID deaths in any group, it's kind of uh, you know, a, a relationship between uh, how many people there are in that group, how many of them got infected and died of COVID without going to hospital, how many of them got infected and died of COVID going through hospital. And and, and it's because of differences in these parts of the pathway that uh, any differences in death must have occurred, right? And what we've found so far in studies, at least in the UK, is, is that uh, the differences in deaths between uh, the different ethnic groups has largely been 
uh, due to differences in the probability of getting infected in the first place. So it's kind of difference in exposure to disease. And so that link A uh, on this diagram. So now let's look a little bit at um, what underpins those those differences in, in the arrows, or how do we explain what's going on on those arrows? And, and I think a useful way to think about this is this uh, social determinants of health framework. So most of you will have seen this picture, but, but the idea is that uh, health is created by uh, a whole bunch of different factors. So, so whether you're healthy or not, uh, is, is due to a whole bunch of different things. And, and those things partly are in your control and partly are not in your control, partly they're societal. And you can see in this kind of rainbow diagram, the things which are further out uh, are outside of your control. And as they come closer and closer into you, you get more into to things that are very personal to you. And, and, and the idea is that things in your environment, things in your working conditions, things in your living conditions, your access to healthcare, all of these things, shape your health and they also shape other things that shape your health like your behavior so uh, if you're uh, unemployed that might impact on your likelihood of being obese or your likelihood of smoking if you have poor access to nutrition if you have so all of, all of these things obviously link back and forward to each other and, and so so this kind of says that there's a lot of different things that will impact your health and, and a lot of those things are uh, determined in society, things like working and living conditions, education, etc. And when we think about health inequalities, we often use this framework to say that your position in society uh, or your position in a kind of social hierarchy gives you differential access to these social determinants of health, which then impact on your health behaviors, which then impact on your health. And so um, health inequalities are often caused by social patterning in wider society. And, and this is a, a similar kind of uh, picture that's been used uh, in the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health. It's a little bit more up-to-date version of the same idea. So if we think about uh, this kind of link between being well and getting infected to COVID, this A in our diagram, and think about what could be causing it. And so certain types of people uh, may be more susceptible to COVID. And, and it's people, for example, who have contacts with lots of people so, or lots of infected people. So people who work in hospitals or teachers or public transport workers or supermarket workers, um, you know, things like the ability to work from home will impact your likelihood of coming into contact with the virus. If, if you're uh, less able to work from home, like a supermarket worker or a public transport worker or a nurse, uh, then you're much more likely to have caught COVID, right? And then you can think about things like your ability to raise safety concerns. So people in precarious jobs or people uh, who, who are worried about uh, their employment situation, they may be less likely to say that, I feel unsafe, please, um, can I have access to PPE? Please, can I be not on the front lines facing customers or facing patients because uh, you feel that uh, if you're seen as a difficult employee, that might lead to you not having a job anymore. And so that, that kind of precarity uh, is also something uh, that's important. And, and then uh, also these ideas of uh, if you can have uh, paid sick leave or access to uh, other kind of benefits, um, that make it might make it more likely that you're uh, protected from the virus or you're able to be treated when uh, you get the virus. Whereas if you don't have access to healthcare, if you don't have access to benefits, or, or if you perceive and actually uh, COVID has been an exception in this no risk cost to public funds hostile environment policy, but a lot of patients don't know this and, and they're worried about accessing healthcare because they they're worried that it might lead to deportation or large bills. And then we can think about living conditions. So uh, these have also been attributed to um, to more, to higher infection rates, so overcrowded housing, living in, in densely populated areas, uh, densely populated uh, houses or, or multi-generational households where you have old people who are vulnerable to the disease living together with uh, younger people who may be working in those essential worker jobs and, and bringing in the virus. And so if those people live together in the same areas, 
that that could have uh, more impact on spreading. So there's a whole bunch of, of different living conditions that can impact your likelihood of getting COVID. And then you can think about uh, you know access to transport. So uh, if you own a private car and you're traveling around in your own private car, you're much less likely to have been exposed to disease than if you're traveling by public transport. Uh, and then there's, there's something about behavior and you know, younger people may be less risk averse and, and more uh, willing to congregate. Uh, people in certain types of jobs may be able to work from home, may be able to isolate safely if they live in less crowded houses, et cetera. And so, so there's, there's lots of great public health advice out there, but it doesn't necessarily apply equally to everybody. It's not necessarily as appropriate to all groups of people. And if we look at some of these factors and, and how they might be racially patterned, so I've, I've just taken a, a few of these just to give you a taste. So uh, you can see overcrowded housing. So and, and what we mean by overcrowded housing is that people who are involuntarily having to share bedrooms in their houses. So you can see that uh, in the white British population, that's 2% of households, whereas in the Bangladeshi population, that's 31% of households. In the Pakistani population, 16%, et cetera. And so, so you can see there's a massive racial patterning in housing conditions. Here's something around uh, precarious employment. Uh, we have this category in the UK, which is called BAME, or Black, Asian, and Minority Ethnic. It basically captures all non-white people, and it's often used in policy documents or statistics. And here we can see that uh, BAME people are double as likely to be in different types of precarious employment as the white population. Here you can see in particularly high risk jobs, so, so it's turned out that in COVID times in the UK, uh, transport drivers and operatives, so, so the delivery drivers, bus drivers, taxi drivers, these people have been uh, really badly impacted because they've been the ones who've been out and working a lot and, and, and interacting a lot with people during uh, the pandemic with very limited access to uh, PPE. And so you can see these kinds of jobs are also massively patterned with uh, Pakistanis and Bangladeshis being three times as likely to work in these jobs as the people from the white population. And we have this general measure in the UK called the Index of Multiple Deprivation. And this measures a, a whole range of uh, housing conditions, working conditions, air quality, crime and, and poverty and all sorts of different measures of deprivation. And here I've ordered households in uh, white households and uh, BAME households uh, and looked at uh, where they live according to how deprived these households are in terms of deprivation. And so in the blue bars, you can see the BAME households and you can see they're massively concentrated in the most deprived fifth of areas in the country. And there's that gradient that they're more and more likely to live in poorer and poorer and more and more deprived areas. Whereas the white population is, is more uh, concentrated in more affluent areas in the country. And so you can see that uh, these social determinants of health are very much uh, ethnically patterned in the UK. And, and I could draw you uh, hundreds more of these graphs for, for each of these little uh, details, right? And so, so if we start to break down uh, that uh, probability of getting infected a uh, picture, uh, and linking race with the, the probability of being infected with COVID, we can start drawing a, a DAG or, or a directed acyclic graph to think about how we might break this down. And so we know there's some link between working conditions and COVID, and, and we saw that was the types of jobs that you have. We know that there's a link between living conditions and COVID. There's a link between you know preventive behaviors and COVID. We know that there's a link between working conditions and living conditions. We will think about that in, in a little bit, what those links might be. Uh, there may be a link between the kind of job you're doing and your ability to, to, um, to conform with preventive advice, right? Um, and similarly with living conditions, right? So if we start breaking this down into, into even more detail, we can think about what are these working conditions we're talking about. So we're talking about essential or key workers who have had to work through the pandemic. We're talking about precarious employment and those people who aren't able to raise safety concerns who, who would have to work uh, even if they felt unsafe who would uh, yeah uh, we would and, and these obviously impact on uh, your income and you're more likely to be low income if you're in these kind of jobs and your income might impact on your your ability to own a private car or use public transport uh, 
if you live in a highly uh, dense area, so this is now moving to living conditions, you're more likely to have caught COVID. If you live in overcrowded housing, and why, why might you live in overcrowded housing? It might be because you can't afford uh, less crowded housing, then you might be more exposed. And so you can see that there's all sorts of interlinkages and we can keep breaking this down further and further and get a really interesting causal picture of, of why uh, there might be a relationship between race and being infected with COVID. And, and often people just say it's poverty, but, but it's now, I think, quite interesting to think about, especially once you start thinking about how do we deal with some of this increased risk? What are interventions we can think about? It's, it's important to think about what specifically is going on that's making people more likely to be at increased risk and where might we intervene uh, to have the biggest impact. So, so we can draw these DAGs and start to estimate uh, cause, causal pathways and, and think about how we're going to do this. And, and so this is part of the, the research project that we are doing. If we look at some of these other arrows in our in our kind of overview diagram, we had uh, you know the the people who are directly dying from COVID, the people who are um, going to hospital and dying from COVID, right? And and some of that might be frailty due to age. Some of that might be impacted in frailty due to having other comorbidities. And of course, your likelihood of having other comorbidities or other sicknesses, particularly things which have been or risk factors, particularly things which have been um, linked to COVID, things like BMI, diabetes, hypertension, uh, also very racially patterned and linked to stress and, and these other social determinants. Right? And so uh, these are things that they, they say are linked through things like allostatic load. We can also talk about things like the, your degree of viral exposure due to your living conditions. So if you're in very close contact with somebody who has COVID, you might actually get a lot of virus into your body. And, and so when you do catch COVID, you might get it much worse. Again, there's a lot of the science around COVID is quite hypothetical and, and we don't know much of the detail. Then there's your interactions with the health system. And, and in the UK and US, there's been a lot of evidence to say that non-white patients are treated uh, less well or receive poorer quality of care and prim both primary care advice and hospital treatment than uh, white patients, not particularly in, in terms of COVID, but more generally in, in various different diseases. And so, so you can see that all of these different factors can, can be used to start to decompose these other uh, arrows on this pathway in similar ways to, to what we did with, with that infection risk. But as, as I've said, uh, thus far, it seems the infection risk is uh, the major factor driving uh, differential uh, outcomes for the different ethnic groups. Okay? And then uh, let me finish just by talking a, a little bit about how have people been interpreting these differences. So, so there's been one group of people uh, who have been saying that these differences have been largely down to cultural differences and lifestyle choices. Right? And so when uh, these differences first kind of started being discussed in the media in, uh, before the summer or during the summer, uh, one of the key kind of journalists in the UK, Melanie Phillips, has written this, that uh, having been inculcated with the unchallengeable belief that they are victims of white society, black people believe that any disadvantage that they may suffer is not the result of bad luck, circumstances beyond anyone's control, or perish the thought, their own behavior, but must be the product of white racism. And so implication being that a lot of the increased risk here is, is going through differential behavior and this differential behavior is really uh, down to people's choices and, and people, non-white people or black people specifically uh, are behaving in risky ways and it's their own fault that they're getting more COVID. Uh, here's another uh, article from the director of, of a kind of government aligned uh, think tank called Civitas um, who writes, as it happens, prior medical complications are not found in equal proportions in all ethnic groups. These differences have no connection to discrimination. Then there are cultural differences. South Asians are more likely to live in large households comprising three generations. These are lifestyle choices unrelated to discrimination. So, so again, it's, it's largely about bad luck, uh, biological inferiority, where some groups are just biologically um, more likely to be sick uh and uh, lifestyle choices so so these are really 
lifestyle choices, cultural differences, uh, things that people have chosen, and therefore it, it's kind of their own fault that they're dying of COVID, or it's bad luck. It's nothing to do with uh, societal factors. Whereas on the other side, there's a, a group of people have have kind of uh, put these differences down to what they've called structural racism, and and so here is a quote from Sir Simon Stevens. Uh, that uh, came out just after the murder of George Floyd in the US, and, and Sir so Simon Stevens is the head of the, the health service, the NHS in England. And so he writes uh, these two moments, so he's talking about uh, the COVID deaths and George Floyd's murder. These two moments are not disconnected. It's increasingly clear that COVID-19 is having a disproportionate impact on our Black, Asian, and minority ethnic patients, friends, and colleagues. And this in turn has brought into stark and urgent focus the layered impacts of years of disadvantage and inequality. The flashpoint may have been righteous anger at the murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, but it would be wrong to marginalize this moment by trying to compartmentalize it. Is racism over there in America, but not here in Britain? Or racism as part of our history from slavery to the Windrush, but not our lived present? That would be to misunderstand and obscure important truths about fairness and equality in modern Britain. And here's another quote from uh, Sir Michael Marmot, who's uh, a leading health inequalities uh, researcher in the UK and, and the, the author of that WHO report on the social determinants of health. So he says, uh, structural racism abounds in the UK. We need starting now to address structural racism and the deep-seated inequalities that cause inequalities in health. So, so these people have this view that those differences uh, in working conditions, in living conditions, in behaviors are caused by structural factors, are caused by this racial hierarchy, uh, which is giving people differential access to the social determinants of health, which is giving people different exposure to risk, which is giving people uh, different COVID outcomes, whereas other other the other previous group have said it's more down to uh, some kind of uh, cultural factors or, or lifestyle choices that people are making, and 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 those are the things that are uh, causing the differences uh, in COVID outcomes. And, and so we can see that if we look back to our think back to our kind of rainbow diagram, these people, the, the second group of people, are talking about factors further out in the rainbow causing those uh, bad outcomes, whereas the first group of people are talking about the kind of things right at the core of the rainbow, people's choices, and uh, assuming that they are not in any way linked to structural or, or wider factors. Uh, and I'd just like to bring up a case study here. So, so here's a case study of somebody who, who died of COVID in the UK. Her name was Beli Mujinga. Uh, Beli Mujinga was a railway ticket office worker, so at London Victoria Station. So you can see it's this kind of job uh, that she had to do um, even during lockdown, uh, very much uh, facing customers. Right? Her employment, employers knew that she had a res respiratory problems, but still insisted she worked on the concourse and interact with passengers. So, so she had comorbidities, right? Uh, so again, one of those things we saw in our causal diagram that she had comorbidities. Uh, and the, the maybe, and she had requested that she doesn't work on the concourse, but she instead works in the office. But her employers decided that no, she should work on the concourse despite having these conditions. She she had requested PPE, but she was not given PPE, so she was not given any protective equipment. Um, and a man claiming to have coronavirus spat at her on the 22nd of March, and she died from COVID on the 5th of April. Uh, and it may come as no surprise to you that Beli Mujinga was a black woman, right? And so, so it's, it's interesting to think of, of this tragic case study in terms of those social determinants and all of these things that I've highlighted, which uh, may have impacted her risk of dying of COVID. So let me say a little bit about uh, the next steps uh, in our research plans uh, before I finish and, and open up for questions. So. So we're hoping that uh, by drawing out these clear causal pathways between the different factors that have contributed to the to the COVID deaths, we can uh, do some more meaningful causal estimations uh, of of how different factors have impacted on COVID outcomes. And so often uh, you've, we've seen studies come out where uh, 
it's unclear why certain things have been controlled for or other things haven't been controlled for. And there's no clear um, there's no clear causal pathway in, in the analysis. And then so you, you see things like um, black people have more chance of dying of COVID, but then you control for the fact that they're poorer and then some of that goes away. And then you start thinking about why are you controlling for the fact that they're poorer? Is that part of the cause? causal pathway or is that uh, some kind of a, a factor that needs to be controlled out? So so just thinking through causality carefully, I think helps us to understand what should and shouldn't be can adjusted for in our models. Then once we can, we can uh, parameterize those pathways, we can decompose the causes of COVID deaths and the inequalities in those deaths uh, and, and think about what are the key things in these pathways that are amenable to change uh, and are having a big impact. So um, Often uh, people get distracted by things which may have some impact, like uh, vitamin D supplementation or things like that. But actually, if you look at the whole picture and look at all the different causes uh, and then quantify that the relative impacts of different things, those things may have quite small impacts overall compared to things like working and living conditions. Um, and so actually it helps to contextualize things and then helps to prioritize uh, where efforts need to be put to reduce COVID deaths and inequalities in those COVID deaths. And then once we have a model, uh, it's uh, useful to be able to look at uh, ex post evaluation of major previous policies, so things like austerity, and think about their role in causing COVID deaths and COVID-related uh, health inequalities. And finally, and, and perhaps most importantly, uh, as we think about proposed interventions, we can do ex ante evaluation, thinking about where do those interventions, things like vaccines, uh, things like differential housing policy or uh, job protection programs or universal basic income or these other things can be used and the, uh, uh, the kind of impacts that they may have and the cost effectiveness and inequality impacts of those things. So those are uh, the next steps and, and uses of, of this kind of a modeling approach. And, and it'd be interesting to get some feedback on this from you all. And some of the challenges that we've faced is that um, ethnicity is not routinely recorded in many of the key data sets. And so we've had to do, or, or the government has been doing uh, particular uh, specific analysis, linking various data sets uh, to try and get a sense of what's going on. Uh, another key problem has been that it's been very difficult to get a sense of how many people overall have been infected with COVID because testing has just been so chaotic and, and it's and even in terms of uh, antibody tests because of waning antibodies it's it's been quite difficult to get a sense of, of that so so there are various data issues and then a lot of our data on living and working conditions come from the census which is now 10 years old and things have changed uh, in 10 years it's also quite difficult to get permissions to link uh, individual level data on various social determinants across data sets uh, and for that, things like the longitudinal cohort studies that exist in the UK, things like the Millennium Cohort Study, or understanding society are quite useful. But when we start looking at subgroups uh, like ethnic minority groups, uh, the numbers start to fall uh, very quickly and, and there's a limited amount of analysis that you can do with that. So in summary, uh, we've seen that uh, race in the UK is closely tied to the history of empire and the racial hierarchies that underpinned colonialism are still very evident in contemporary government policy. COVID-19 has hit black Pakistani and Bangladeshi communities much harder than the white population in the UK. And this has primarily been with, because uh, uh, these groups are more exposed to the virus and are more likely to get infected due to working and living conditions. Right? Some people have argued that this is due to cultural difference and lifestyle choice, while others have argued that this is due to structural racism. So I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mikdad. Um, we have a number of questions here, so I'll just read them out for the group. And um, we have about three questions here, so we might get some more as we go, but uh, just for you to know how much time you should take on answering each one. Mm -hmm. And um, so the first question is, why do you think ethnic inequalities are given less credence in the UK policy discourse compared to socioeconomic inequalities? And 
I'll let you answer that one first, and then there's a second part to that question. Yeah, I mean, I think um, NIC inequalities are very difficult to measure in the UK because a lot of the key data sets don't contain ethnicity variables. And so, um, so, so partly uh, it's because of that. Um, and partly because it's it's quite hard to disentangle those two things. As, we, as we've seen, a lot of uh, ethnic inequalities are actually mediated by socioeconomic inequalities. Uh, and somehow it's seen as being more acceptable in the UK uh, to target policy directly at social socioeconomic factors, the, the kind of mediating factors, than think about the broader causes of those socioeconomic inequalities. And, and this is more both in terms of uh, ethnicity, but also in terms of you know, broader economic processes. Why is there so much income inequality? Why is there so much uh, you know, general inequality in housing and jobs and other things? And, and those things are less a target of policy than um, maybe, uh, how do you say, dealing with the consequences of those things. You know? and, and so, so actually the policies which people have been much more comfortable with have been how do we deal with the fallout of inequality if somebody is more sick how do we target more healthcare resources at them not why is that person more sick uh, not why do they have a worse job but how do we you know deal with the consequences of that person having a worse job and, and i guess that's to do with the structure of the economy and who wins and loses by restructuring uh, the economy and, and what that means for different voters and different lobbying groups and, and so so there's probably uh, important political economy factors uh, uh, shaping what is and isn't important. And it's it's been interesting to see the shift in focus towards ethnic inequalities with COVID and Black Lives Matter. And, and some of these things, I think, uh, interestingly, surprisingly, have, have come as uh, unexpected inequalities. I mean, you would think just looking at the data, it would be obvious that there would be ethnic inequalities, but but it's somehow been surprising to people that they've existed and, and partly because of that kind of blinkered view of looking at everything through uh, that socioeconomic lens without thinking what causes those issues, socioeconomic factors. So I don't think I've really answered, but hopefully I've thrown some light on, on some of the thinking there. So the second part to that question, Mikdad, is there a conceptual framework to reconstruct ethnicity in light of the influx of literature and emphasis on ethnic inequalities in health given recent global events such as the racial riots in America and COVID? So I, I'll repeat the first part of the question. So mm -hmm. is there a conceptual framework to reconstruct ethnicity? So I'm not sure what that means, but, but I think it's it's quite interesting um, how ethnicity has been considered by different researchers. And, and I think one of the interesting things with the COVID pandemic in the UK is that most of the data has been uh, held within the healthcare system and the people who have been able to analyze it have been largely clinicians. Uh, and clinicians have treated ethnicity as a biomarker, kind of like blood pressure and weight and other things. And then they've they've kind of considered ethnicity as a biological factor. And in social science, ethnicity is considered as something that's socially constructed. So, so there's nothing biological about being Pakistani versus being Indian or being Bangladeshi or being white for that matter. Uh, these things are socially constructed categories and it's it's kind of uh, and this is kind of goes back to the the title of this talk. Uh, is it race or racism? Is it some biological feature of yourself or is it how you're treated by society that's that's led to those outcomes? And and so I think there's this interesting swing. So so I think in general um, researchers have moved away from biological explanations of race, partly because there's no biological foundation to them, but partly because they also underpinned uh, movements like the eugenics movement, which uh, you know, it was a scientific kind of justification behind the Holocaust. Um, 
and a lot of the colonial uh, you know exploration which, which was around biological superiority and, and so so a lot of these these things are very outdated in social sciences but they've become so so what's known as race science has kind of come back into fashion uh, partly because the people who are doing the analysis um, don't know better, do we say? Yeah, I, so I, there's a question here. I'll, I'm going to kind of add to this question, and you've talked about it a little bit. Um, so this question here is about what adjustments you made or weighting of pre-existing mortality rates of these groups. Um, so there's this general question about whether you weighted the groups other than by age, which you said that you did. Um, but I want to expand that a little bit into, um, and you have mentioned a little bit about causality and whether it's race causing these things or these things uh, being a bigger picture. So uh, by these things, I mean socioeconomic status, et cetera. So, um, you know, how do we as researchers contribute to that uh, racist research? Sometimes, like you were saying, without meaning to, um, in the kind of analyses that we do and how we frame questions and how we go about answering questions and, and how can we avoid that racism in our own analysis? Yeah, I mean, I think we as researchers have to think quite carefully what we mean by race or, or what does race mean? And so, so one of the interesting uh, other things that I've noticed is that a lot of country uh, studies have started to combine uh, or do meta-analyses of, of different studies in different countries. And, and especially with things like uh, race or ethnicity because these things are socially constructed they mean very different things in different countries you know and so uh, being an indian or pakistani or bangladeshi in the uk uh, means something very different to what it means in um, canada and again something very different to what it means in um, the middle east you know and, and so and similarly, being black in Nigeria means something very different to being black in the U.S. You know, and so, so starting to com combine these things, uh, you just really have to think carefully about, uh, given that race is a social construct, what does it mean in different societies? Why are you using it? What is it a proxy for? And if it's a proxy for racism, then be clear that it, it's a proxy for racism. It's a proxy for if it's a proxy for culture. So, so I think partly it's about being very open about what our hypotheses are and why we have those hypotheses and why we're even putting race into the question. Uh, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is thinking about those causal pathways. And, and as we were discussing, I think that's what you're alluding to, that um, if race uh, patterns certain things which then lead to bad outcomes, should we be controlling out those certain things? And, and what does that even mean? And so thinking carefully about causal pictures and those social determinants of health and how they're patterned and why they're patterned and how they interact with each other is really important for us as researchers to really uh, carefully grasp so that we can understand um, what is important to adjust out and what's not important to adjust out in our analysis, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I mean, we really have to consider what we're doing when we're including a, a race, a racial um, indicator, and then socioeconomic status in our model, and how those react together, and what it, what does it mean, you know, to our results if we're controlling for both of those things, and and the um, effect that that has. And I think sometimes we don't do that. And so, um, along with the question that was asked here, did you control for anything other than age, and how did you make those decisions? Mm -hmm. So, so the the rates that I presented here were actually rates uh, from the Office for National Statistics, so the National Statistics Office in the UK. And so they were the ones I showed you were uh, only age age and sex adjusted. Um, 
and they were directly standardized against the European standard population. But actually, they also produced a range of rates adjusted for a, a whole bunch of different socioeconomic factors, which uh, were kind of quite misleading because they, they, in my opinion, adjusted out things on the causal pathway. But coming back to um, differences in, I think this is, is part of your previous question, differences in uh, mortality rates more generally outside of COVID. So, so interestingly, um, migrants, there, there's a, a concept in epidemiology called the healthy migrant effect. So people who migrate across countries are typically a, a healthier subset of the population than the average person. And so there's a selection effect that healthier people migrate. And so uh, when they move into their new population, they typically live longer uh, than the native population because it's this uh, self-selected healthy subset. And partly it's because those are the people who choose to migrate and partly it's because some of the people, especially those making the more kind of difficult journeys may have died along the way. And so, so there's this kind of uh, effect that you, you tend to get people who are healthier. And then you have this other effect uh, which is called uh, salmon bias, which um, as people from uh, migrant groups get older, especially first generation migrants, they tend to go back to their countries of origin to die. And so again, that, that reduces their mortality rate. So typically we expect migrants, especially first generation migrants, which most of these people are given that they've migrated across in the 70s and, and most of the people dying are, are in the 80s. Um, these people we would expect to be healthier than the average uh, white person in the UK, uh, and yet we're seeing worse rates. And so we're kind of seeing this this interplay between them being naturally healthier and then the social determinants of health impacting them uh, badly to to result in them having disproportionate deaths. Great. Uh, well, we really appreciate um, your presentation, Mikdad, and you sharing your expertise with, with us. Um, just before we finish, I just want to announce the next NOAA rounds, which will be December 2nd at the same time, and we'll send a link around. You need to register at the NOAA website to get that link. Um, the next one will be called 23 and Not Me, Incorporating Family Members and in Health Technology Assessment of Genetic Testing and it will be presented by Dr. Wendy Ungar from the University of Toronto. McDad, we really appreciate your presentation and your insight and um, look forward to hearing more about your research in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. I'll talk to you soon.